right. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's colloquium with Viola Stroma as our guest speaker. I'm personally very excited um, to have you here today. Um, Viola uh, actually uh, is originally from Germany, although she's right now uh, located in the US. She received her PhD from the Max Planck Institute from Human Development and the Humboldt University in Berlin. She then conducted her postdoctoral research in the Department of Psychology at Harvard, working with Dr. George Alvarez and Dr. Patrick Kavanaugh uh, in the Harvard Vision Lab. And before coming to Dartmouth Mouth College, where she currently heads the Perception, Attention, and Memory Laboratory, she was an assistant professor at UC San Diego. And today we're going to hear more about how orienting attention to salient sounds enhances visual perception. And uh, with that, uh, I would say the stage is yours. Thank you, Laura. And thanks uh, very much for inviting me. I'm very excited to present some of my work to you all today. Um, and I'm going to start off with, um, since I come from a traditional vision background, I'm going to start off by showing you just an image of a room and just kind of, I want you all to kind of look around the room and notice how effortlessly you can recognize all the different objects in this room, right? The bookshelf in the back, the big sofa in the front, and this kind of big black and white spiral right there, which used to be used to study kind of motion perception. This is all from the Harvard Vision Lab. And so while you're looking kind of um, throughout these different objects in a room like that, um, it feels very effortless, it feels very easy to recognize all these objects. But I'm sure what most of you didn't notice is that within kind of these last 10 seconds while I was talking over these different objects that you see in the room, um, this entire picture changed drastically. And the initial image that I put up actually looked like this one. And I'm sure you've all seen demos like that before, um, right? This is just a nice illustration of really kind of showing our severe um, limits on um, perceptual cognitive abilities. We cannot attend to all the objects at once in this room, and we can also not remember the exact details of what we just saw as we're moving our eyes around in a, in a picture like this. And so uh, my lab broadly is interested in understanding these um, perceptual cognitive limitations um, and really bridge perception and cognition with the ultimate goal to understand perceptual cognitive abilities and their capacity limits. And as um, Laura already just said, my, my lab focused kind of on three aspects, perception, attention, and um, working memory. In the domain of perception and also attention, we really focus on kind of cross-modal aspects of that, so how audition and vision inter interact. Um, and um, in working memory, we kind of focus on really understanding the capacity limits. And the general approach in my lab is to scale up from um, kind of well understood perceptual representations closer to the real world and with the goals to in or goal to increase external validity while still having detailed control of stimuli and the ability to understand mechanisms. In today's talk, I will primarily focus on attention and um, in particular, I will uh, focus on how orienting attention to salient sounds can change visual processing. And this cross-modal approach is just one example or one way to kind of, I think, scale up from the most simplest classic attention studies to incorporate some aspects of the real world. As in the real world, our attention is very often kind of drawn or captured by salient sounds, for example, the loud horn of a, of a car, um, and maybe even more so than other salient visual stimuli. And I think it is particularly informative about how attention and perception operate across these different modalities um, and how they integrate information about sounds and visual objects to form multimodal representations that we really interact with and deal with um, in everyday life. Um, and before I get all the way to kind of cross-modal interactions and the neural mechanisms of these, I will be starting by providing kind of some background how this research program started um, about 10 years ago, a little longer already. Um, and really it started with a very fundamental question um, that um, has been of debate of over 100 years in psychology and kind of philosophy more broadly which is this question of whether attention alters appearance. And so we all know that attention improves perceptual processing, right? That we're fast at responding to attended stimuli than unattended stimuli. 
Um, but one uh, question that was largely unanswered was whether attention can actually alter the appearance or our subjective expressions of the world around us. Um, and this has been a much more controversial question. And um, this goes back, as I just said, kind of to the earliest days of psychology. So for example, William James proposed that attended objects appear more intense than they actually appear in the real world. Versus Georg Fechner, for example, suggested that attended objects appear truthful. So that essentially attending to an object makes it appear like it exists in the real world. So what does this even mean, right? These two points. Let's take a very simple visual object here, two of these Gabor patches that we like to use in vision studies because visual cortex responds to them really well. So it's just these graded stimuli where we can control the actual contrast really, really well. And so here are two objects with exact same contrast. Fechner would have said, okay, once we kind of start attending to that object, it should appear to us, we should have the subjective um, impression of an object that really matches how it exists in the physical world, essentially. While well, William James suggested once we start attending to that object, it actually appears higher contrast um, than it actually is. So how can we test this in an experiment? Very briefly, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here with this task, but um, we designed a task where we asked participants to judge the orientation of the higher contrast um, patch. And we always showed two patches at the same time in different orientations, one or, or, um, oriented horizontally, the other one vertically. Um, and then um, prior to these patches, we oriented attention using a salient sound. And so we used a sound in this particular task to avoid kind of low level interactions between visual cues and this visual patch, um, just to make sure that what we're actually looking at is attention effects and not some low level interaction, because you might imagine a brief kind of peripheral visual stimulus at one location is actually gonna kind of prime visual cortex and then maybe enhance processing of these little patches and make them appear higher contrast, but not due to an attentional mechanism, but possibly due to kind of low level sensory interactions. And so we use these sounds um, that appeared on the left and the right, um, kind of external speakers from external speakers and the sounds were non-predictive, but the idea was still that they would capture attention either to the left or right side of space. The sounds are really salient. I'm gonna play you one example. So you get an idea. It's just kind of these brief noise bursts that we're presenting. I don't know if you all heard that. I'm going to turn it up next time for the next example, but it's basically just this pshht kind of um, brief, brief attention capturing um, sound. And so across the experiment, we varied the contrast of one of the patches from really high contrast, 78% all the way to 6% contrast, but all super threshold, and matched that always with what we call like the standard patch. So one contrast was always fixed. And so that way we can actually um, kind of measure a psychometric curve and see whether participants are shifted to say, to judge one, pa one patch as higher contrast when it appears at the same or the different location as the sound. And broadly, what we found was that participants judge the contrast at the sound's location higher contrast than the exact same um, patch at the uncued or at the location where the sound did not appear. Um, and nicely now in this design, as you can see here, we do have trials where the two patches are exactly matched in contrast. So they're both 22% contrast. So exactly the same um, contrast entering visual corte cortex essentially. And we can just focus on these trials to look at the neural response that's elicited by these sounds and by using EEG. And what we, find was, what we found was that early visual processing in particular the visual P1 component for those of you who are familiar with this was enhanced for the patch at the sounds location. And so I just wanna point out here that um, the only difference right, between these two waveforms that I'm showing here, which you also don't have to pay attention to, but the only difference is whether there was a sound at the, at the particular location or not. It's exactly the same contrast entering basically left and right visual cortex, but on, at one particular location, there's either a sound preceded right beforehand or not. And so this suggests that indeed um, cross modal attention can enhance visual processing and it does so at a very early stage. So kind of within that first feed forward wave of visual processing. And so this study that I kind of glanced over here very quickly was kind of the beginning of really trying to understand what these cross modal effects are. Right, so in this study, we showed that salient peripheral sounds can enhance perceived contrast such that a Gabor patch is perceived or reported to be um, higher contrast when it appears at the same location as the sound as shown here on the left relative to when the sound appears at the opposite location. 
And we're not the first ones to show these types of cross mold effects. There's many other people that have shown that visual processing is um, enhanced broadly for um, co-localized um, sounds. So for example, sounds can improve the discrimination accuracy. They can increase the detection of visual targets. So if targets are presented kind of sub-threshold, the sound can kind of boost processing of these. And also many studies in the 90s by Spence and Driver have shown right, that um, they result in kind of speeded reaction times. So there seems to be really strong links between kind of sounds influencing visual processing. And these cross modal effects of attention raise fundamental questions about the connectivity of our sensory modalities and the architecture of the human attention system. So the big kind of the question that I wanna to try to address today is why and how would sounds influence visual processing? What is the role of attention in connecting between these um, two sensory modalities? And can we get a little bit of better understanding of the neural mechanisms underlying these interactions that we see definitely in behavior and where we also see that the visual processing of the targets um, is influenced. And so um, in the first part of my talk today, um, using human electrophysiology, so EEG, I will show that sounds can um, bias visual cortex activity and that these biases um, can even happen prior to the onset of a visual target and appear to be relatively um, robust to different types of tasks that we're using. And then in the second part, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into the question of really what the, what the mechanisms are, what the neural correlates are. And I will hopefully convince you that we have some suggestive evidence at least that sounds improve performance by mostly by increasing and not by suppressing neural processing at the sounds location in visual areas. Okay, so the, the main task that we're using is really similar to the, that I'm mostly gonna be focusing on, is really similar to the one that I showed you. Here we're using a visual discrimination task. So I'll just walk you quickly through the general design. Um, so we're using again, these little patches here, um, oriented gradings on the, that can either appear on the left or right side and that then are masked. And we're asking participants in this case now to simply judge the orientation of that, these patches. So whether they're oriented clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, prior to the onset of these patches, we are again presenting the left and right sounds. Again, these are sounds that are coming from kind of far field speakers. All these stimuli are really far in the periphery, about 25 degrees of visual angle. And um, kind of in the, in the first version here, the sounds are completely non-predictive of where the target will appear and also what type of target it is, so which orientation it has. And we can use this task, we can calibrate participants to a kind of performance of around 70, 80% per, per correct. Um, by just doing a little calibration prior to the main task by changing the contrast of that Gabor patch. And so to give you an idea of how these tasks feel like, it's really quick. I'm gonna show you a couple of demos. Let's see how well this works on Zoom. Um, but um, just to get an idea um, of kind of how, how, how quickly it feels and how, how difficult the task can be. So here's a demo. As a participant, you would be staring at the fixation cross, right? Because we're call, um, recording EEG, so don't move your eyes. Um, and you're gonna hear a burst of a sound. You're also gonna see the sound, which of course is different than the actual experiment. Then a brief flash of these Gabor pet, uh, Gabor pet a mask, and then you have to uh, figure out the orientation. So you can just point maybe clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, that's the response. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So I don't know how well this worked. This was counterclockwise, so kind of like leftward. We can do one more demo. Same task. Okay, so it's all really quick. Um, this was again um, counterclockwise. And so these were two examples of what we would call the first one a valid trial, so where the sound appears at the same location as these Gabor patches, and the second one was an invalid trial. So the sound, of course, we don't have like the spatial resolution here to hear the sounds, but that's why I showed the sound appeared on the right side and the patch showed up on the left side. And so participants are actually told to ignore the sounds as good as they can, but they're pretty salient, so it's hard for them to ignore them. Uh, but we tell them to try to ignore them because they're not actually helpful for the task. Now, what we find um, performance-wise is that um, the sounds that are non-predictive of the targets, so just the example that I showed, do influence performance quite a bit. Um, it's a small but very reliable effect that we find um, between participants. And so here you can see I'm plotting the proportion correct in this um, orientation discrimination task for validly cute 
trials, so where the sound and the Gabor appear at the same location on the left, and invalidly Q trials. So we find um, a difference in performance here such that the sounds are actually increasing the target discriminability. Now, in another version of this task, um, we asked the same participants to do this exact same task, but in that case, we're actually making the sounds predictive of the target location to kind of see it's basically a hybrid version of kind of a voluntary attention task and an involuntary attention task. So here we are telling participants, okay, the sounds will actually predict the target location with 80% accuracy. So try to kind of orient your attention to where the sound is. And to make sure that participants have enough time to do that, we lengthen the interval between the sound and the target. So they actually almost have like almost a second to kind of keep attention there. So the idea is the sound's gonna grab attention kind of automatically, but then participants can use that sound to perform better in this task. And it turns out we find very similar performance levels and we find a very similar validity effect. So the, the magnitude of these effects is almost surprisingly similar, right? You might imagine that, oh, if you have kind of the interaction of exogenous being grabbed by a sound, and on top of that, you can kind of put your voluntary attention that you find larger, larger effects, but we really find um, the same kind of increase in performance um, for these um, sounds that are predictive. So overall, in this task, we find that participants are more accurate for co-localized targets, regardless of whether these sounds are predictable or not. And so um, now we want to ask the question of how these sounds um, are actually influencing target performance. And so what we're gonna do is look at whether the sounds themselves have an influence on visual cortical processing prior to the visual targets. And so this question is building on a lot of work from other spatial attention studies, in particular voluntary or endogenous attention studies that have found kind of pre-target baseline shifts, shifts. So if you ask participants to kind of shift attention to the left and the right side, many people have found that you find increases or decreases in neural activity even prior to the onset of the target. And so this has been very well studied in endogenous attention. So here now we want to see whether these kind of exogenous sound cues also elicit some similar pre-target biasing and anticipation of a visual stimulus. And so we can first look at this in our, what I'm gonna call hybrid attention tasks. So where the sounds are actually spatially predictive, um, where we have our long SOA. So here I'm gonna now be plotting the event related potentials um, over actually parietal occipital cortex. Um, and so negative is plotted up just to orient you here. And we have um, our time with the Q onset. So the sound onset at zero milliseconds, we're plotting all the way out to about almost 900 milliseconds. This is all when there's no visual target yet, right? But we're looking over visual cortex. And I'm gonna be separately plotting the ERP waveforms um, for the hemisphere contralateral to the sound. So the opposite side is where the sound appeared. So sound on the left, um, right he hemispheric activity and ipsilateral to the sound. So when the sound is present on the left and I'm gonna be plotting um, the left visual cortex activity um, in blue. So I'm collapsing here across left and right side and left and right hemisphere. And um, what we find is um, a kind of funny looking ERP waveform maybe because we're looking at an auditory evoked potential over visual cortex. So just to, to orient you here, that's why we don't see like standard N1 component that you would maybe expect if you were looking over auditory cortex. Um, but we find that the waveforms largely overlap for the two sides up until about 240-ish milliseconds. And then we find that the contralateral waveform becomes more positive relative to the ipsilateral waveform. And this is kind of a long lasting um, positivity, positive deflection about almost 200 milliseconds um, that is really largely um, distributed over occipital parietal cortex. So here I'm plotting now the topographical map, contralateral minus ipsilateral. And I'm just kind of leaving the left side here um, blank and just project that difference on the right side of the scalp. And you can see in this kind of predefined time window um, we see very clearly an occipital um, focus of this activity, really suggesting that this is something over visual cortex. And so this um, suggests, right, that the sound itself, the spatially predictive sound here, actually biases visual cortex activity prior to the onset of a target. So it's kind of um, relative, so this, the, the waveform is more positive over the visual cortex um, corresponding to that location relative to the ipsilateral waveform. 
Um, and so this was actually very surprising to us when we first saw this. It really suggests that there is some kind of biasing going on really quick, relatively quickly, relatively early on. It is here to point out that this happens pretty quickly and then dissipates, although the target has not happened yet, right? So that, that's possibly interesting of what this activity really means is a kind of the shifting of attention or really a pre-target biasing as has often been proposed in endogenous attention. Um, I'm not gonna focus on that part here today, um, but we find this very kind of strong um, lateralized activity um, in this spatially predictive task. And so, um, of course, we can, what we want to see now is how automatic kind of the spicing is, right? Does this only happen because the sounds here are actually spatially predictive? Is this actually some endogenous component of attention or is this something more reflexive? And we can do that in our second task, right? That I actually showed you first in the non-predictive case. So um, we have the second task in the same participants with a short SOA where the sound also precedes the Gabor patch. And um, of course, it's a little tricky here in this task to actually look at the auditory evoked potential on the trials that are behavior relevant because the target appears 60 milliseconds after the um, sound. So of course it would be kind of overlapping in our waveform. So what we're doing instead, we're actually inserting these half of the trials where we just don't present any target stimulus and the participants doesn't know which one is which um, trial. So they're all randomly intermixed, but we can use this half of the trials where there's no visual target presented to actually look at what the sound itself is doing to visual cortical activity. And um, because we don't have anything visual happening on these trials. And so we can plot the exact same waveforms for this task. So for our left and right non-predictive sounds, um, we can plot the contralateral and ipsilateral waveform. And um, what, we, what we find is essentially exactly the same type of pattern that we find for predictive sounds. So around 200 milliseconds, the contralateral waveform becomes more positive relative to the ipsilateral waveform with regards to the sound's location. And um, we find the same type of topographical distribution over parietal occipital cortex, again, suggesting that these peripheral sounds that we think capture attention to the left and the right side, elicit um, activity over occipital cortex, probably a mixture of parietal and visual activity and kind of bias prior to the stimulus, or even in this case, an absence of a visual stimulus, activity over visual areas. And so um, I just didn't, didn't point this out, but we, for now, we're just gonna term this component, the auditory contralateral exhibitor positivity, just to describe basically what we're seeing, right? It's elicited by auditory stimuli and it's contralateral positivity over occipital lobe. So in short, the ACOP, I'm gonna kind of use that throughout the talk, just so you know which one I'm talking about. So that's really the difference between contra and ipsilateral waveform. Okay, so where, where are we so far? We've, we've found that sounds can activate contralateral visual cortex activity in a spatially specific manner, right? Such that when you hear a left sound, um, that actually elicits activity over right visual cortex relative to ipsilateral. Um, and um, secondly, we've seen that this activity starts at around 240 milliseconds or so post sound onset, regardless of the predictability of those sounds. And um, at this point, our interpretation is essentially that possibly these sounds are essentially kind of like prepping visual cortex, right? Or kind of sending attention hotspots back to visual cortex to kind of prepare visual cortex to be ready to do this really difficult cross-modal uh, discrimination task, right? To just like kind of be ready to process these stimuli really quickly and accurately. Because in all of these tasks that I've shown you, there's always visual targets present at least on half of the trials, right? If not more, in most cases, actually all of the trials. And so one hypothesis is that um, these um, sound induced modulations only happen when participants are in this cross modal context, right? So only when the visual targets are actually expected. And to test how broad the influences of sounds on vision are, in another task, we actually changed the context, made a really small change essentially, but instead of showing Gabor patches at the end of the trial, so visual stimuli, we changed it to auditory targets. So in this case, it's a completely auditory task. And participants still a difficult discrimination task where they have to basically pick one of the, the high or the low pitch tone of two targets that are presented from the left and the right side. 
And so now, other than that, the task is essentially the same. And so we can see whether we find also these sound-induced modulations over visual areas in a task that's completely auditory, where participants at no point see a visual stimulus. Um, and this really addresses the question whether sounds only affect vision when the brain is kind of expecting visual inputs, right? Or whether this is an effect that extends to other types of tasks and expectancies. And so I'm gonna show you the exact same type of plot that I've shown you before. And um, you'll see that we find exact same component as we've seen before. So at around 240 milliseconds, we find that even in this completely auditory task, um, the control letter waveform becomes more positive starting at around 240 milliseconds. Um, so same, similar time course, similar type of activity um, that we find even when participants never expecting a target. And so this really points to very strong links between kind of the, the auditory system or spatial processing in the auditory system and the visual system, we think. And I'm just going to show you one more version of this, um, because in this, this task, uh, the sounds, the target sounds, they're still um, kind of spatial because they appear from the left and the right side. And the irrelevant sound is actually in some way um, predictable of them, at least in terms of time, right? Because we always have like a two thirds of the trial have this fixed SOA, where it's always presented um, about 150 milliseconds prior to the tones. And so in the last version of this task, um, we just present essentially um, a random stream of sounds to participants. So again, our left and right peripheral sounds that are kind of attention grabbing, but participants are supposed to ignore them. And just on about 50% of the trials, we present a central target tone that's very distinct. And all participants are doing is press a button whenever they hear the central target tone. So they are listening to the sounds overall, but these left and right sounds burns, bursts, they're ignoring as good as they can. They're not responding to them. And we're now taking away this temporal predictability by just having a random stream. So it can be left sound, right sound, and target tone, or, right, or in a different order. And we kind of vary the timing across them. And in this task, we find, again, the same component, this ACOG component. So this is kind of the most extreme case, showing that even in a random stream of sounds, we find that these peripheral noise bursts actually elicit visual cortex activity in a spatially specific way again, following the exact same time course. And so now I've shown you that across many different experiments, we find that these salient sounds can boost contralateral relative to ipsilateral visual activity. And that that seems to be related in our cross modal versions of the task to um, visual performance, such that, um, that we find actually those participants that have this larger ACOP amplitude also tend to show the better discrimination performance. And so, Broadly, um, what this suggests is that there's this very robust um, ACOP component that we find that seems to exist across different types of task contexts with a similar temporal and spatial profile. So it almost appears to be relatively automatic or reflexive and um, pretty fixed, essentially, um, which, again, I think raises interesting questions about the connectivity of our sensory modalities. Right, so, so what are actually, how, how is this actually implemented neurally? We do know that there are direct connections between kind of early auditory cortex and early visual cortex, but given the relatively late latency of this component, um, it's probably not these direct connections that are actually producing this effect, but it's probably some indirect pathway, right? I think we kind of infer from this like relatively late latency that there's probably other brain areas involved and we do see some parietal activity as well. Um, and so um, what, what we think is that, especially given the fact that these effects are very spatially specific, is that spatial attention does play a critical role here, um, right? I don't know if this is like actually the parietal lobe, but just kind of like pointed this here, but since we see a parietal activity it probably plays a critical role. And so um, I think this interpretation that spatial attention plays a fundamental role here in kind of making these connections between sound processing and visual cortical activity um, really, um, yeah, really kind of suggests that um, attention or exogenous attention in this case kind of sends back to visual cortex these kind of hotspots to um, enhance visual processing and or in preparation for possible visual targets. And I think the spatial selectivity is really the most exciting part of this data. Many other studies have shown that sounds can influence visual cortex um, more broadly, but here we really find that it's in a very spatially specific way. And I think this has 
really important implications for spatial processing across modalities. This, of course, links to a lot of work that is also done in your institute, right, where um, you find kind of very interesting interactions between kind of spatial processing across sensory modalities. Um, and I think it, for example, suggests that there might exist this like kind of sound-based spatial topography that is kind of coded essentially in visual coordinates, possibly because um, of the spatial dominance of um, visual cortex in general, where we have these really fine-grained maps. And such a mapping seems to exist at a minimum at the heme field level, right? So left versus right, which is what I'm showing here. But I think one really intriguing possibility is that there's actually a much more fine-grained map of kind of sound um, processing, spatial locations of sound that lives or is being projected back to visual cortex to take advantage of this like fine-grained map of visual cortex. Um, and in our particular case, it seems to suggest that as long as the sounds are kind of grabbing attention and um, are really salient, that um, this seems to be a relatively automatic influence that has nothing to do with participants doing a particular spatial task on those sounds, but actually just the sound itself, so just like the bottom up drive of these sounds can actually elicit these spatial specific activation in visual cortex. And I think there's a lot of questions kind of that need to be followed up here to see how fine-grained map that is. Is it really as automatic or robust as we think it is? And um, how much does it actually depend on kind of the task participants are doing? But so far it points to that it's pretty independent of those things. I'm not gonna focus on kind of these types of questions today, but I'm gonna focus on uh, in particular on the part of um, what this means for um, kind of what we learn about spatial attention, in particular spatial exogenous attention. And so um, many prominent theories have um, proposed that spatial attention kind of relies on two types of neural mechanisms and operates by excitation and via inhibition at the same time, based on this like general idea that visual processing is a strictly limited resource and that if processing get enhanced at one location, it basically needs to get suppressed elsewhere, right? To kind of counter those uh, limited, um, limited pool of resources. And there's tons of evidence for that, in particular involuntary top-down or endogenous attention. But there's very little that we know in the context of cross-modal attention tasks, and also very little that we know actually in terms of exogenous attention tasks more broadly. So how excitation and inhibition occur when a sudden event kind of grabs your attention, such as a sound, for example, and how exactly these boosts are. And what I've shown you so far is always relative differences between kind of contra versus ipsilateral cortex. But um, now I want to dive a little bit in more into like what, what are actually these effects? Are these actually increases in visual cortical processing um, relative to the sound's locations? Or are these decreases um, in neural processing relative to where the sound did not appear? And I'm going to do this kind of in three different ways. So first, I'm going to focus on alpha oscillations. Then I'm going to try to link the data that we have to um, some behavioral measures on a trial-by-trial -trial basis to see if we can kind of predict certain types of behaviors better than others. And kind of at the very end, we're gonna to try to experiment to isolate neural enhancement and suppression um, in, a, in a kind of a modified version of the task. And so, so far I focused uh, just on event-related potentials, but of course we can also look in the same types of task at oscillatory activity and specifically alpha oscillations that have been linked to top-down inhibition in particular, Broadly, we know that a decrease in alpha is related to more visual processing, so neural enhancement, while an increase in alpha is related to less visual processing or inhibition. And many um, endogenous attention tasks in particular have used alpha as a marker to really understand kind of these, these kind of two sides of basically attentional selection, right? Enhancement and suppression. And so this is a very well known and well established marker. And um, it has not only been shown in the visual modality, but also in the auditory modality, and um, has been suggested, right, by people here in the audience too, that it's kind of like, like the supramodal type of att spatial attention um, system marker, essentially, um, um, but predominantly really related to endogenous or top-down attention. So the question here is, do we find similar type of alpha changes also in our kind of cross-modal versions of the tasks um, where we have these sounds that are non-predictive and that we think are relatively independent of top-down control? Um, and I'm just gonna show you, we've looked at alpha essentially across all of our tasks. I'm just gonna show you again here, which I think is the maybe most, most extreme case of how automatic these types of changes arise. 
So the last task that I showed you where we just have this whoops, random stream of sounds um, with our noise bursts that are task irrelevant from the left and the right and once in a while a central target tone. So this is not even really a spatial attention task. At this point, it's a very simple task, but we can look at um, these peripheral sounds. Do they elicit any type of alpha activity? And so what I'm going to now be plotting is the time frequency plots where frequency is here on the on the y axis and time from sound onset zero milliseconds is on the on the x axis. And I'm first going to be plotting the time frequency um, over the hemisphere ipsilateral to the sound. And so what we see is that there is kind of this small increase in alpha activity right here around a decrease, sorry, around 10 hertz. So um, we find a little bit of a decrease in alpha activity over the hemisphere ipsilateral to the sound, so same side as the sound, and much more pronounced um, over the contralateral side over the sound, right? So this is showing the same plot. And you can see that starting around 200 milliseconds, kind of the leading almost all the way to 800 milliseconds, we find this um, decrease, stronger decrease in alpha over the hemisphere contralateral to the sound. And so um, it's maybe a little bit easier to see when we look at the difference plot. So we can just subtract the ipsilateral activity from the contralateral activity, which really reveals again a quite lateralized um, alpha activity, really similar to what we've seen in the ERPs, right? So you can you know, see it's the same similar type of time course, 200 to 500 milliseconds about. Um, and this is all over occipital cortex, right? These are all the same types of electrodes prior to occipital cortex that I've shown before. And so I just want to point out a few things here, right, that I think is like very intriguing about this data. Um, first of all, it really suggests that, um, or is broadly in line with the idea that alpha reflects spatial processing signal across different modalities, um, right? And, but in this case, it's only driven by bottom-up input of these sounds, right? So when the spatial location is not really relevant to the task itself, but of course, spatial location is deeply contained in these sounds that we're using, right? Because they're presented very peripherally to people. Um, alpha here emerges relatively quickly. So many endogenous attention tasks often show that lateralized alpha, very similar in pattern overall to, to these types of patterns, but that they arise maybe 500 milliseconds or so post um, Q onset. But here we find that arise, that alpha actually arises really quickly, this lateralized alpha around 200 milliseconds after these peripheral sounds, we already see these decreases. And so um, this suggests that alpha itself is not only related to kind of top-down control or the task demands itself, but it's also a signature of kind of this um, exogenously driven type of attention. So it seems to reflect kind of a common effect of spatial orienting in visual cortex. And so this really suggests that alpha might be a more general marker of visual cortical biasing in general, and not just when kind of top-down and endogenous attention is involved. Um, most importantly, I think uh, for the question that I want to address today in particular is that we actually find these bilateral decreases in alpha. So very often in the literature it's reported that alpha um, actually increases ipsilateral to um, a Q, an attention cue, for example, and decreases or kind of stays the same even, contralateral, but here we find these bilateral decrease in alpha, um, which is kind of very different from the pattern of classic studies on top-down attention. And this might suggest, or I think is a first hint that possibly these sounds, they're not suppressing any activity over the cortex ipsilateral to the sound, but they just kind of result in an overall enhancement of neural activity in visual cortex, then that enhancement is biased, so it's even stronger over a contralateral hemisphere relative to the ipsilateral hemisphere. So I think this is broadly consistent with the idea that um, we're mostly dealing with a visual enhancement here that's triggered by the sounds with no clear suppression. If we use alpha at least as our marker or increases in alpha as a marker of suppression, neural suppression, that we don't really see evidence for here um, when we kind of look separately for ipsilateral and contralateral um, activity. Now, secondly, I want to try to link these ACOP and alpha changes more directly to behavior. And so we can do this by using a similar task that I've shown you before, by just adding a little trick. So in this case, participants um, are doing a target, a, a letter discrimination task instead of these Gabor patches. So just indicating whether they see a T on an L. That's masked again, so it's a difficult task. And the sound is 
pre preceding either at the same side or opposite side as the target just as before. And all we're changing now, we're kind of extending the time a little bit between the sound onset and the target. So we have around 300 milliseconds to basically look at our neural measures, the ACOB and alpha prior to the onset of the target. And so that will allow us to split up trials depending on whether participants got it correct or incorrect. And so now let me just walk you quickly through kind of the predictions of what we would predict um, our two hypotheses of whether we find enhancement or suppression or maybe a mixture of the two. So the idea here is that if the ACOP, I'm gonna focus on the ACOP first, but for alpha it's the same logic, and um, reflects primarily enhancement, you would expect to find a larger ACOP, so more positive in the hemisphere contralateral to the Q, precede and correct than incorrect discrimination performance, um, but not necessarily a difference for these invalid trials. Now, conversely, if the ACOP reflected suppression, we would expect to find a larger ACOP, so more positive in the hemisphere contralateral to the Q, preceding incorrect than correct discriminations on invalidly queued um, targets. And so the idea here is basically, or the logic here is that this neural modulation, so in this case, the ACOP predicts performance either just for validly queued trials because it affects processing of information at the queued locations, so at the location of the sound, or it may predict performance just for invalidly queued trials because it reflects processing of information at the unqueued location. And so obviously there can be a mixture of both of them, right? That we actually find predictions in both directions, but that's kind of the, the logic of, um, of our data analysis here. And so what we find is uh, for the ACOP is um, data consistent with the idea that this reflects enhancement, right? So we find um, that the ACOP, the magnitude of the ACOP, which is now plotted here, so that's the contralateral minus ipsilateral difference, predicts performance for validly queued trials. So we find a larger ACOP when participants get this correct compared to incorrect, um, but we do not find any difference between the invalid trials, suggesting that the ACOP is actually kind of like marking, essentially processing at the validly queued location. And so this um, implies then that the ACOP does not necessarily reflect suppression at the unqueued location. And so we can make the, do the exact same analysis for our alpha measure, same logic. I hope people are following this logic. I just see that there's something in the chat. People should interrupt me. Rah. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll come to the question later. I think it's like an old question, okay. So for the alpha activity, we're doing the same type of analysis and we find the same type pattern. So it really seems to also point to that alpha is following very closely our ACOP component here. Um, so again, lateral alpha here predicts performance only for valid trials. Again, possibly suggesting that these alpha changes reflect facilitation in particular at the attended location and not suppression at the unattended location. So this is kind of our second piece of evidence that we find these very selective type of predictions for performance um, in, for ACOP and alpha, which is broadly consistent with the idea of visual enhancement and not suppression at the unattended location. Now I'm gonna show you one final experiment, which is just again, one tweak of kind of the same paradigm. And we're trying to experiment and isolate the neural enhancement and suppression, um, not by looking directly at performance, but by introducing something like kind of a baseline condition. And so, we're going back to our Gabor patch task, right? So same, same logic as before, we have our left and right sounds, but now we're also introducing a third sound, a central sound that we're trying to, that we match as good as we can in kind of low level um, properties. So same sound, same amplitude of the sound, um, but that sound appears in the center. And so the idea is um, that it should kind of elicit the same type of, of course, um, auditory activity, but also the same type of alertness and temporal predictability compared to the left and right sounds. And the only difference between the left and the right was the central sound is really that the central sound essentially does not elicit a spatial shift of attention. And we have our short SOA trials that we can use to look at behavior, but we also have trials where we have a longer SOA or no target at all that we can use primarily for our EEG analysis. And so here, um, the idea is that we find our ACOP component, right? That's just the contra versus ipsilateral difference in kind of amplitude of, of the waveforms. Um, but, and, the, and, and here the idea is that if the contralateral waveform differs from the central sound, for example, is more positive, this would be consistent with contralateral cortex getting enhanced 
right? So that would be a pattern like this um, in an ideal world. Um, or it could, of course, also be the case that this waveform actually um, matches essentially the contralateral waveform, but differs from the ipsilateral waveform, which would be more consistent with um, the idea of suppression. And again, of course, um, we might expect kind of an intermediate version, right, of kind of a central sound boosting both hemispheres a little bit, um, which would then suggest that we find a little bit of enhancement, also a little bit of um, suppression across hemispheres. Okay, so here I'm plotting now um, just the ERP data for this task, the contralateral and ipsilateral waveform in red and in blue, just as before. So this is our ACOP component that you've seen before and the topography that you've seen before. And now the interesting question is, where does this ERP to the central sound falls, right? Which I'm gonna be plotting in, in green. Um, and so what we find is that the green waveform, so elicited by the central sound, really overlays completely with the ipsilateral waveform. It's almost hard to see. So I'm just going to show you here the um, overall amplitude for our three conditions. So we find um, that the waveform contralateral over contralateral cortex relative to the sound um, is enhanced, is more positive relative to both the ipsilateral waveform and also the waveform that is elicited by the central sound that does not induce any spatial shifts of attention. And so at least um, on this hemifield level, right, where we're just comparing kind of left versus right, it seems to be that there is mostly just like more activation, um, but not any um, detriment in activation. So no suppression um, over the hemisphere ipsilateral sound as least relative to our baseline with the central sound, right? Which is not a perfect baseline, but it's trying to, to be a baseline as good as, as, as good as it gets, basically. Um, this pattern of neural data matches in our task very well the behavioral data. So here we can do the same type of cost-benefit analysis, where we also find um, just improvement for the validly Q target targets relative to our invalidly Q targets and also the central sound, which is essentially another version of invalidly cute tra targets, but where basically no spatial attention shift existed. So overall, this suggests that cross modal exogenous attention enhances contralateral visual cortical processing um, and does not show any ipsilateral suppression, at least in this kind of early time window here that we're looking at, right? Between 200, 400 milliseconds, which matches the time course of exogenous attention. Okay, so now I walked you kind of like a series of different types of ways we try to get at the question of whether um, the salient sounds enhance or suppress visual cortical activity. I think we have some suggestive evidence that's currently consistent with primarily visual enhancement. I think there's still a lot more to be done to really kind of get at this question a little bit more, different types of versions of probably introducing distractors and things like that that we're currently working on. But so far, it seems to be mostly consistent the data with the idea that exogenous attention, cr exogenous cross-modal attention enhances visual cortical processing at the sound location with no direct evidence at this point for spatially selective suppression at the, at the location where there's no sound present. And um, just one, one last slide here on, um, I think, just want to kind of point out that I think these data could have potentially really important implications for spatial attention more broadly, um, certainly in the cross-modal context, but also more general ways when you just think about kind of stimulus-driven or exogenous attention where it's top-down or endogenous attention. Um, we know that both of these types of attention can show really similar behavioral benefits. For example, these effects on perceived contrast and discrimination and curiosity that I showed today, but also many others. And we've also seen that they kind of, when we look at the broader literature, that they elicit similar neural responses over visual cortex. And I'm just going to point you to, to this paper by my grad student, Jonathan Keefe, that just came out, um, where he's really directly comparing these types of measures, ACOP and alpha oscillations, in an endogenous and exogenous attention task. And we find really similar types of effects of um, kind of attention on visual cortical processing, though they're all shifted in time as you would expect. So exogenous attention kind of elicits these changes really early on, like I've shown today in the talk. Um, and endogenous attention shows really similar type of patterns, which are kind of like shifted 300 milliseconds in time, as many other people have shown already. Um, so it seems to be um, the case that maybe these two types of attention are not as different as often kind of proposed in the literature, but I think one potentially um, difference between kind of the neural mechanisms of these two is that um, stimulus-driven exogenous attention, at least in the cross-modal context, 
is uh, primarily kind of enhancing visual cortical processing at the attended location with no signs of suppression, while top-down endogenous attention possibly involves both enhancement and suppression. And I think this could be deeply related to kind of the time course of these different um, types of attention, right? That just takes it a longer endogenous attention is usually a little bit more sluggish. So maybe that can then involve this inhibitory component. So I think there's still lots of work to be done to kind of test this, right? I put question marks here. This is speculation at this point. Um, but I think um, this, this could potentially suggest that there is really a fundamental difference in how each attentional mode supports target selection exogenous attention possibly, mostly via enhancement in early cortical pathways at least, and endogenous attention through both enhancement at the attended location and also a suppression of unattended locations. Okay, I'll stop here. It's just a quick summary that I maybe don't have to go to so that there's a little bit of time for questions. I'm realizing I'm running almost late here, sorry. Um, but hopefully I've convinced you that there's um, very robust effects broadly on sounds on visual perception that can influence visual performance, but also visual cortical processing across a variety of tasks. I want to thank all the co-authors on the work that I presented today, in particular, again, pointing out Jonathan Keith here, my graduate student and an undergrad in the lab, Emilia um, Pokta, who uh, ran a lot of these experiments, um, my whole lab at Dartmouth and at UCSD, and I thank you all for listening. Thank you. Very interesting, Dita, and great talk. Um, and sorry for the confusion with the, the question in the chat. Maybe I should have uh, said earlier that we're just going to do that in the very end. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> oh, it was probably there for, for a while already, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, before we get to that question that is already there, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, just to uh, sort of keep the whole question asking um, a little uh, organized, um, I would like to ask everyone who has a question, um, either if, if you would just like to ask your question in person, just maybe type your name in the chat. Um, or of course, if you prefer uh, me to read out the question, you can, you can of course also type uh, your question uh, in the chat. But since we already have one question from Andy, maybe Andy, you wanna unmute yourself and uh, just repeat that. Uh, I know it came up earlier in the talk, if, if that's still. Uh... Uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, and Yo, <laughs> this, this was a, a really fantastic talk and, and my apologies for um, interrupting, I, I didn't. Oh, no worries. That. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think um, it's kind of nice to be interrupted on Zoom sometimes. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was a fantastic talk, and I and I I love the um, the results. Uh, my my every time I found myself asking a question or having a question, it was usually answered on the next slide. So I think this is an example of that. I was when you were first presenting the first ACOP results, I was um, wondering whether the the trials on which you were measuring the ACOP with the sounds by themselves, either with the long ISO, uh, SOA or with no visual target presented, were on the same blocks as those with yeah. visual targets, but but they were, right? They yeah. were, exactly. So it's all yeah. randomly intermixed. The participant doesn't know um, what trial is going to appear or not. Yeah. So hopefully and, we're and not, yeah, so the, the ACOP is too quick, I think, to explain that, like, oh, they, they noticed that the that the target is not there. And we have versions of this task, right, where we have the long SOA to kind of avoid some that the ACOP is related to some anticipatory oh, or like surprise response. Oh, there was no target, but usually there is. So that's why we, we actually half and half, have right? trials yeah, so. like long SOA trials. So the target still appears. So it's really um, temporally also not predictive, the sounds. Yeah. Cool. I, mean, I have loads more questions, but I, I want to give other people a chance to ask as well. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> somebody else first. Okay, maybe I'm going to jump in because because Lewis just commented he's going to wait for a woman to ask a question. <laughs> we we actually had a discussion about that earlier that if if women if women a, a woman asks a question first, then other women are more likely to also ask questions. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try to boost that now a little bit. <laughs> um, you you already. Um, mentioned that you're playing around with also introducing distractors 
So I guess kind of an obvious question that comes up is maybe you, you simply don't find evidence for suppression because there is nothing really to suppress, right? Do, do you already have like first data that you could talk about or what would your, be your expectation as how that pattern would, would yeah, change? So, yeah, so we don't have any data, unfortunately, because this last study, I think we kind of wanted to do it as a second experiment, the last study where we present our central uh, tone, that was exactly a year ago. So right then data collected for EG unfortunately stopped. But um, yeah, I think it. I think it would be very nice to introduce the distractor. I think it would be first. I mean, the first version is just to have a distractor on the kind of unattended side because we're the whole time looking at kind of left versus right um, processing. My hunch is actually when we present distractors on the on the opposite side, that we find the exact same effect that there's no clear suppression, even if participants are in this context. Because I really think it it happens so quickly, and it's like on the other side of the of the heme field that I think it's. It's basically happening too fast in exogenous tension for even suppression to kick in. Kick in, I guess my model of suppression is that it takes like first enhancement and then maybe it kind of falls out, kind of secondary of the enhancement. And there are some papers by Green and McDonald kind of suggesting that the suppressive side of alpha, if you just kind of go with the alpha interpretation of increases meaning suppression, that they actually take a little longer to kick in. Mm -hmm. So my expectation there is probably that we find something similar, but I totally think it could change once we start playing with distractors within the same HEMI field to kind of at more nearby locations. Mm -hmm. because there's also these models of attention, right, that you have like largely independent resources for each type of HEMI field that I think here could kind of not show us a suppression left versus right, but maybe within the HEMI field, once you like start introducing distractors kind of within the same spatial map, Mm -hmm. right, so in the same HEMI field that then maybe you find evidence for suppression. Mm -hmm. And so we're currently doing that just behaviorally with some online studies where we just try to introduce neutral cues and kind of have distractors around the target. But it's a little too early to tell whether we mm -hmm. find difference there. Um, yeah, the, doing this online, it turns out it's much, much harder. We need <laughs> participants and uh, calibration and everything is hard. But yeah, so we're kind of starting to ask these questions. And this is, I think, generally my expectations are that, that I think with the like more kind of distractors within the same HEMI field, we might find suppression essentially. Cool, very interesting, thank you. Um, then I'm just gonna pass the word to Daniel. Hi, and uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Um, so when I first uh, saw those data, uh, also when I read the paper, um, it reminded me kind um, of, um, of an effect that we also usually observe in auditory search. Mm -hmm. So um, you're surely uh, familiar with this uh, original work by um, Gamble and Luck, and it was Gamble, uh, yeah, with the N2AC and so on. Um, and um, so we have an N2AC um, and Afterwards, there usually also comes um, contralateral positivity that's also found over the posterior sensors. And I would be interested in, um, do you think there's a similarity there? Is, is, mm -hmm. might, might it be a similar process? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the, the, so we don't see any N2AC in our data, but of course we don't do like a search type of paradigm, right? There's only one sound presented at once, like either on the left and the right side. So if you look over auditory cortex, basically we only find a small contralateral enhancement in like the auditory N1. That's basically all we find. We don't find like any anything that looks like an N2 AC. But I know, yeah, there's like kind of what, what follows the N2 AC. I actually remember having this conversation with Marissa Gamble many, many years ago at a conference where we were trying to compare the topographical maps and the time course of this later effect and this ACOP that we're finding. And our conclusion was that it's something different, but I would actually have to go back to, um, to really, I think, looking in a more fine-grained way. And I think, and it, does it always appear? Do you always find in all tasks or is it kind of depending on what participants are doing? So we, we found it only in, uh, in auditory search. Um, I think there's yeah. nothing similar in visual search really. And we well, haven't it, done it in a cross-modal setting yet. Um, well, actually, if, if I may interrupt you there, it also shows up in the, so the, the few pilot um, experiments that we did with the audio visual search. So there it shows up as well. So that's at least a multimodal setting, but 
yeah, so far it's it's been there pretty robustly in at least the auditory only um, settings. And, and you're talking about like the later way, like not the N2AC, but kind of the later, longer. Yeah, it's it's way later. Um, yeah. Like 400, 600. Yeah, exactly. So the timing was like off, I think. It was like even late, much later than the ACOG, which is, I think, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we thought, oh, it's something different. And But yeah, I'd be super curious to hear like when you when you see that and when, when it's not. I think uh, we thought it kind of depends a little bit more on task and it's not as automatically elicited at this earlier ACOG. But it seems like there might be some interesting similarities and potentially, and we really haven't seen this, that the that this ACOP or alpha, alpha is a little different. Alpha is way more sensitive to kind of top-down controls. So if we make the tone predictive, mm -hmm. alpha lasts longer, but this ACOP really just kind of appears and disappears, no matter kind of what task we give participant with the sounds, it seems like. Um, but maybe, so maybe it could be a mixture of both, right? You initially have to maybe an ACOP, but then if the sounds are task relevant because they're doing visual search with them, you mm -hmm. might find like a longer lasting type of ACOP, which would be really cool. Uh, yeah, maybe this this shift in latency it might be due to the task you know it's so yeah different. yeah which would be really so interesting things and this is an irrelevant auditory cue so it appears earlier but yeah interesting point yeah that would be really interesting we should like actually like maybe chat more and like actually compare because that would be really interesting to see like when the earlier versus the later part happens because we've been trying to push it later and it hasn't really worked for us so maybe we should like look into your paradigms to see what exactly the difference could be that's driving that. That'd be cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, then uh, Louis, you want to go next? Um, sure. <laughs> so I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have a pre-question um, and a question, and then a main question I'm really interested in. So my, my pre-question is, um, and you don't have to answer this, I noticed that you didn't perform um, any cortical localization in spite of your claims. Um, was this non-analysis based on principles? I've noticed the link to uh, Stephen Hilliard. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> so it's not perfectly that... reasonable if you say that, you know, you, you, you just don't believe and you know spatial localization. Oh no, um, actually we've done we've done a bunch of spatial localization. Yeah. I guess I took it out of my talk by now. Oh, with okay. Steve <laughs> yeah. So uh, all the all the earlier stuff and mm -hmm. earlier stuff meaning like the 2013, 14, kind of like the first time we, we saw the ACOP, we did spatial localization and we find a very, very clear visual visual co visual cortex focus only. I, I didn't see. show this here. We did both distributed source modeling and dipole modeling. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and both converged on the same type of um, lo lo localizers, basically. So that was pretty comforting that we saw both. Um, yeah, I'm going to be very honest. I'm not a super big fan. I think they're like, mm -hmm. I think they're like interesting models and they can tell you a little bit, but I, I don't think they right. can, Fair they're enough. not super conclusive, right? Right. But certainly the ones that we did, and we did it kind of in the, we didn't do it in this like most recent work, but all the, all the other data, I mean, across many different experiments, we kind of find the same visual cortical activity. But now in this later data, actually we find it looks more like there's two foci, like a parietal and a visual one. Mm -hmm. So it, I think that made me a little bit less confident in, in the, maybe in the earlier stuff where we just find only the clear visual focus. And I think there's like better ways to experimentally isolate it. So now mm -hmm. Jonathan actually wants to test whether we can kind of isolate the parietal and the visual focus mm -hmm. of this ACOP by having kind of participants already shift attention and see if we just find enhancement, if, if attention is already shifted basically to that location, or if we can just kind of manipulate only the shift and trying to experimentally do that, which I think is a little bit more clean than doing uh, just the dipole modeling, but yeah. So then I do have a main question, especially yeah. in the phrasing or the words that you use, and I, I apologize if this is quite high level. Um, so we are talking about, we're talking about this within the framework of attention right, and attentional orienting. But it's not entirely clear to me, and I'm not even sure if this distinction is, this functional distinction is necessary. I'm not really certain if your experiment and your results actually speaks to attentional orienting, or if it actually speaks to cross-modal processing or enhancement. And I, I kind of feel like there, there ought to be a distinction from where I'm coming from, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, but but the way that you're approaching it with regards to you know like um, ipsi versus contralateral, um, the to- topographical selectivity, you know, and and saying that it actually boosts visual, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it it strikes me more in terms of like work that talks about how it's actually supporting visual perception as opposed to the actual orienting mechanisms per se. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think, I, I, I don't know what your view is on this. So I'd like, I, I just wonder if you could expand on that. Yeah, <laughs> I probably have a, a mixture of views here. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly I think we're, I mean, it's a super hard question. I, I'm totally fine with a model where like, you, I guess take mm-hmm. out this, the, the attention part is like, I mean, mm-hmm. the attention is like a broad word that we use all the time without even often defining it very well, right? Mm-hmm. I think, so So initially, I, I think it's told like that the explanation of just a sound activating visual cortex, totally fine with that. I think it might just, just be that, right? Maybe you don't even have to put the word attention in there for these explanations. I just think that these activations have certain properties that are consistent with how people usually think about spatial attention, which is that it increases performance, right? Which is just like something that we know attention does. <laughs> It also, um, I think what, what I kind of tried to point on is one slide, the fact that it's a relatively slow latency of these like 200 milliseconds suggests that there's other cortical regions involved, right? That I'm broadly referring to as maybe it's a spatial attention network because we know again that like maybe, right? I'm just referring to this attention but there has to be some essentially reformatting of the processing the sound location to send it back to visual cortex, right? And whatever that process is, I'm here just kind of like referring to as attention because I don't know exactly what it is. And we do know that there's like these direct like subcortical maps, right? Multisensory maps, but it seems a little slow to just, just do that basically. So I think there's like probably some parietal regions involved which are generally consistent with the idea of some attention network. Um, and so, and then the fact that we find alpha activity, which people have strongly associated with attention. So I think like there's just like these certain properties that match the current framework of how spatial attention, like what a spatial attention does more broadly. But I don't even need, yeah, I, I would be totally fine with just like taking out the word attention and just kind of describing these properties. I think that's a totally fine, fine way to talk about this data too. It just may, might make sense, or sometimes helpful to try to talk about this, I think in this framework of, of attention more broadly if it shares these certain properties. Um, mm, so just to clarify my position, so I, I have no problem with the fact that you use the term attention uh, insofar as cross-modal enhancement is, is concerned, but I feel like if we're really talking about mechanisms that underlie reorienting from central to periphery, in fact, I would feel that your findings of, of hemispheric asymmetry would not be your biggest finding, assuming that we have a modular network, but rather we would really be getting at which neural structures per se um, support and underlie the reorienting of spatial attention. Does that make sense? So that, at least in my, in my, in my mind, that would be the distinction, right? So I, I think that your, your, your results make a lot of sense in terms of attention, but attention in terms of um, increasing the gain of Mm -hmm. processing information in the given channel, Mm -hmm. but I'm not entirely certain if it speaks very much towards orienting mechanisms per se, or spatial orienting mechanisms, but I don't Mm -hmm. know. Right, so that's 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 how I. Yeah, how the orienting itself. Ha- so, do you mean the distinction of like what effects it has on visual cortex versus like the mechanisms that actually make us orient? I'm not. The the, the, the mechanisms that allow you to to shift attention in space, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, that's fair. I think. I mean, all we're all we're really looking. I probably still use the word mechanism too often, which is just mm-hmm. like. <laughs> really what we're looking at is just the effects on visual processing, right? Like that, right. that's all really what, what, what we got. And it's not really the, me- I mean, alpha is not a mechanism. I completely agree there, right? And I don't think we learn learned anything about the exact mechanisms, but we have, we see that we have diff- these interesting effects on visual cortical mm-hmm. processing, right? That are maybe consistent with enhancement and suppression, which you probably also shouldn't call a mechanism per se. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, I think that's right, that we don't really understand um, how the orienting in space per se happens because we're just looking at kind of visual activity after. But the it is still attention, so don't get me wrong. I mean, it yeah. is still attention, right? Yeah, but but that's that's the part that kind of like you know confused me a little, or not really. Well, you know what I mean. Uh, well, I, 
Anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, but I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting discussion. <laughs> um, Edmund also has a question. Yes. Hi, Viola. Great talk. Hi. Really great talk. Um, I have one question, you know, actually, I'm old school, not, uh, not as old school as Steve Ferrer, but uh, let's say on the same level as John. Um, you know, normally we talk about activation with negativity and not with positivity. So this, is, this was what really puzzled me when, you, when I, I saw this data. Uh, but actually, uh, as Daniel already mentioned, and also if you go to, to visual tasks, you have this inversion of, uh, for example, N1 PC or N2 PC, and then an inversion which is longer lasting. So I, I think that it might be the same component. Um, did you ever discuss about this? Uh, you know, why is it this, uh, this is a positivity? Why is it a positivity and not a negativity? It's positive, you know, normally it's deactivation based yeah. on the structure of the brain. So it seems as if your brain, uh, you know, contralateral to, to the auditory stimulus gets deactivated and mm -hmm. not activated. So you always talk about activation, but you know, it's a positivity. So, um, but what's going on there? You know, we see no, uh, other tasks as well, uh, correlated with spatial information, but uh, uh, this, this uh, simple, uh, uh, assumption that this is uh, um, uh, activation because it makes functional sense mm -hmm. is against the structure of the brain. Right. I mean, actually, with the ACOP, we weren't. Let me let me see here. So we were really surprised. This very brief result that I showed at the beginning of this, like P one enhancement, that we find. No, let's say all ACOP uh, uh, results, so that they have more positivity contralateral to to the, to the auditory source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we weren't that surprised, honestly, when we when we saw that. I, I don't know. I think in the end, polarities are just really complicated in the EG, right? <laughs> I guess that's a general general standard it's really complicated it varies a lot with like how you show the stimuli i mean if you just like show visual stimuli bilateral you get positivities if you show one you sometimes get negativities i don't know in early visual evoke potentials so it's like it's, it's pretty complicated and so in, in this case actually the acop it, it it was really a kind of surprise finding we never even we were focused on like looking at target processing and basically had these in this initial very first experiment we had these sound only trials in there and then this positive really popped out to us. And we were very surprised initially to see it, but it actually resembles this other component, the LDAP, right? You like the late attention directing positivity, which is also positivity. So we just immediately were like, oh, this seems to be something similar. And in LDAP, people have tried to also figure out a suppression or enhancement, or what is it, is the shifting of attention or, or not? Uh, kind of inconclusive, I think, overall, still the data of like what it, what it really reflects, probably a mixture of both. Um, but I, it was not, we, I guess we just made that link really quickly. And so we weren't that surprised that it was a positivity over contralateral cortex, because at least like in these endogenous attention studies and also auditory endogenous attention studies, people have seen that relative change. And I think that's probably also what drove this like link to attention really quickly for us. Okay. That okay. We thought, oh, it's just like shifted in time. It just happens earlier, but it might resemble some similar process that people have studied for, for quite a while and actually tried to figure out um, so I, I don't know. I think, yeah, in the end, I think it's really complicated to interpret just like the negativity versus positivity and you have to try to get it experimentally or, um, to, to really tease those apart, which is also really hard, but I think, um, just by itself, I guess it is really hard to, hard to interpret, but there was never a moment, I think also not by Steve Hilliard or something like wondering <laughs> why it's, why it's a positivity, but I think that's probably okay. came, it's like linked to this other component pretty quickly. Okay, did you, did you ever look at, uh, for example, um, uh, the N1 to the lateralized uh, GABA patches or letters um, re relative, uh, or let's say uh, how this is modulated by the amount of, uh, uh, of your um, positivity of your ACOP? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And we don't, when we don't really know yet, because you can't really do it on the same trials. So it's really hard to do. Okay. Because when you look at the N P1, N1, and this was actually surprising to us. We find, right, this was like one of the, maybe I can, well, I can just maybe describe it. Maybe I'll try to find the slide while I'm describing it. Cause for the, when we look at the, the P1 to the Gabor patch, we find also 
just uh, positivity. Pulling it up here. I didn't really talk a lot about this data here, but you see that it's like a contralateral positivity starting within the P1, which is usually maybe what you find, but it lasts throughout the N1. It stays more positive, and it's not like a classical N1 attention effect where you would find a larger negativity often when you show at least unilateral stimuli. And so this was really surprising to us. And it might be, and what we're doing here, we're like kind of subtracting out the ACOP. But of course, that's assuming that the ACOP has the same size on every trial as our other functions. So we, so we think like this is ACOP free data, <laughs> but who knows? And because it's exactly in the same time interval, like the ACOP actually makes a lot of sense also in terms of exogenous attention, um, in terms of timing, which I didn't really focus on here, but the ACOP starts 200 milliseconds about after the onset of the sound which is exactly um, when basically that visual patch hits visual cortex, right? Because we're presenting at 100 milliseconds later and it takes about 80 milliseconds to get to visual cortex. So that map, the temporal mapping between the ACOP and in general exogenous behavioral effects is really, really close. And so it also matches exactly this P1 effect here. And so how the ACOP exactly relates to this um, P1 effect and this, which we see is also essentially sustained positivity, right? Through P1 and N1 time interval. We have not gotten there yet because it's extremely hard because we're like, it's like in the same trials, right? So how yeah. do you know which one <laughs> you like to have to subtract out the ACOP? And then, so it's really difficult to actually, I think, make that link, but I think it would be really important because I'm, this is still something that I'm like wondering how, how does this actually relate on a like trial by trial basis? And are we really subtracting out the entire ACOP here or is there still some kind of activity left um, in, in this P1 N1 time interval, if that makes sense? Okay. But I can don't you... have an answer. I, don't, I can just say yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just, uh, yeah. Okay. I think we're already like a little bit over time, but I, I think Andy mentioned in the beginning that he had multiple questions. I don't know if he's still here. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Um, th th thanks. If, if, if folks are okay with me asking another question, I'm, I'm happy to. I realize I'm a guest in this particular format, so I'm. I'm <laughs> I wanted to yield a bit um, to, to others. Um, so you answered one question from Lewis earlier about source localization, and I, I had a similar question with regard to the parietal component. So one thing that I was wondering throughout the talk is, you know, how do we know that this is um, a, a visual orienting of attention as opposed to a multimodal orienting of attention? Um, and you tried. You know, you, I think you did a lot of like really cool experiments to, to try to show that it was indeed you know, visual oriented, even in the absence of a visual task. So when you had the, the purely auditory task, I was wondering if you tried something else, perhaps like, um, like putting the subjects in, in complete darkness or having them close their eyes, right? So, so the visual information is completely irrelevant to, um, you know, there's, no, there's not even a chance for them to, to enhance visual perception. Um, and and what is, does the ACOP appear in that sort of scenario? Mm -hmm. We have not done that. That would be cool to actually, then people do have their eyes open and they're staying at a fixation cross, even in our auditory tasks. Yeah. I think it would be cool to do. Of course, it's the data is gonna be really alpha right. <laughs> heavy if you just heavy, yeah. like close their eyes for a long time, even yeah. in the auditory task, because they're sitting in a completely dark room where we really try to make sure they don't basically see the speakers or don't have any reference frames. So it's a pitch dark room in the auditory versions of the experiments. We have like kind of, yeah. A, a dark, like just basically the fixation cross, the only reference points to make sure that they're not moving their eyes, right? To get kind of clean EEG data. Um, but we never had them completely close their eyes. But even in those tasks, it's just like the data does get more noisy and that like just like more alpha overall, right? And so yeah. I think it would be pretty tricky to do. What we, what I have done in collaboration is actually test whether we find the ACOP in congenitally blind people mm -hmm. with uh, Monica Gori at IIT in Italy. And so, there we do find the ACOP in uh, even more pronounced, which is, I guess, I don't know, I think to some people it's surprising, to others not, depending on how you think about um, kind of reorganization of visual cortex in, in congenitally blind, because often they find, like you find kind of activity over there introduced yeah. by sounds, but we find the same type of like spatial specificity. So really, again, I think broadly suggesting that that part of the brain that we reference as visual cortex is involved in spatial processing um, in a kind of in just maybe reflexive type of way. But yeah, I, I think it would be a cool study to actually try to, I don't know, get people that don't have a lot of alpha or just, I don't know, like deal with it, I guess. <laughs> 
um, yeah. to actually make sure that they don't don't have any visual inputs during the task. That'd be cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There is actually, um, they don't look at ACOG, but there's a study by Mata Wussmann from Lübeck where they look oh. at alpha lateralization in an auditory spatial attention task and they systematically compare eyes closed versus eyes open. And I think if I recall correctly, they found that the alpha lateralization increases in, in the eyes closed, but uh, I would have to look it up again. But that's, that's right. That's the only study I recall with that sort of uh, manipulation. Okay, well, uh, thank you for this very lively discussion, everyone. And thanks again to Viola for the very great talk today. Um, yeah, I think we should maybe come to a close now. <laughs> And uh, yeah, let Viola enjoy the rest of her day and all of us here in Europe have a nice evening. <laughs> um, we will actually be back in uh, two weeks with a talk from uh, Simon Hanselmeier. Um, so maybe we'll get to see some of you again there. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to Thank you all for joining and goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for organizing, Laura. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye.